Uh, we Are the Dream and What Happened on September 11th are two documentaries on HBO that examined the worldview of children, one through an oratory competition inspired by Dr. King in Oakland, California, and the other through their understanding of what transpired on September 11th, 2001. Both were directed by the incredible Amy Schatz, and she joins us today. I'm Charlie Bright of Gold Derby, and the first question I want to ask Amy is, uh, how, did you, how did you find out about the oratorical competition in, in Oakland, California? Well, um, the, the origin of this project um, was, I felt very lucky because um, it was presented to HBO and they came to me. Um, executive producer Julie Anderson had been working on a film about Martin Luther King Jr. and came across mention that he had participated in an oratorical competition at a young age, I think he was 15, and came to HBO and said, what about um, considering a documentary about speech competitions? And they um, they said, yes, let's research it. So my producing partner, Diane Collier, dove in and researched this topic and found that the tradition of oratorical competitions is alive and well. There are many, many um, competitions that take place across the country. And she landed on um, Oakland, California in this incredible competition there that we really fell in love with. So that's the, the start of the project. We started to research um, Oakland as a as a, um, a location and they have um, a tradition of the oratorical that goes back 40 years. And what's unique about this place is that they um, they have kids thinking about Martin Luther King Jr. and writing original speeches, original poems, reciting famous speeches and poems um, that, that they've, they've reflected on um, in terms of Martin Luther King's legacy. So um, that's the beginning of the, of the process. So uh, the, uh, the documentary uh, chronicles so many of the uh, of uh, entries into the competition. They were so fascinating to watch them grow from, you know, the, the genesis of it to actually performing it on stage at the finals. Were there any entries into the competition that you wanted to include, but for one reason or another, you weren't able to? So the biggest challenge was there were 40 schools, hundreds of kids. And when we um, began, we we thought, oh, how are we going to do this? This is a competition. We don't know who's going to win, who's going to make it. We started to film in schools. We filmed rehearsals. We filmed the teachers working with the students, developing their material. We filmed rehearsals out of school. I'm just going to quit my, there's a lot of noise going on um, here. Sorry. Um, uh, and we filmed, um, in at school assemblies, we filmed some district competitions and we fell in love with so many of the students and we weren't sure who to follow. So we had multiple cameras going around trying to capture as much as we could. And um, what we realized was, you know, early on, we thought, well, we had the finalists and we didn't know who they were going to be. So um, what we discovered along the way is that it really wasn't about the competition. It was really about the material that the kids were presenting and they were talking about some deep stuff. So we just really tried to film as much as we could. We couldn't include all of the kids, obviously, because we weren't always there. Um, and there was there were a couple of students who couldn't make it to the finals who we actually did film and we followed them to a certain point. But the surprise in the in working on this was that while we thought it was a film about the competition and that it was important to follow the trajectory of, of certain students, it really um, was a competition with many winners. And it didn't matter if they made it to the finals. It didn't matter if we just saw them in rehearsals in their classroom, that really what was important was that we create space for the content and what, what it was that they, they wanted to talk about. And one of the things that I was uh, curious about is, do you know if the events organizers have ever tried to take this competition to other cities? Because uh, I know Oakland seems like a very 
uh, the way that uh, Oakland is shown in the documentary, it's a very, uh, 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 it has a specific makeup that makes it very uh, 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 conducive to this type of competition. But have they ever thought about bringing it to other areas? Well, what we learned in the research early on, and my my colleague Diane was was you know gathered information about oratoricals all across across the country, is that this is something that's that takes place where you least expect it. So there are a lot of competitions that that are happening from Texas to California to Ohio to Florida. Um, and they're all, I think, an opportunity to really showcase kids voices what was you they had this as part of their mission lifting up student voices so they um their goal was to give kids this opportunity to shine so there was a lot of community-wide effort on the part of teachers and principals and administrators and parents in letting the kids have a voice and elevating them so you know, what we also found interesting in Oakland was the population was incredibly diverse and the issues that the kids were grappling with and talking about in their speeches were immigration, um, gender, um, uh, gun violence, social justice. And, you know, these are, you know, it's, it feels like a rise up moment for kids or felt that way when we we were there where kids had a say and had something to say about some of life's big issues of today. And I don't know, you know, Oakland has a has a um, so social justice history. It's a, it's a place where a lot of movements um, were born and have a, a, a current um, home there. So the kids not only reflected, you know, Oakland and you know, its commitment to so social justice, but also, you know, this moment in time where kids are deeply opinionated about the way the world um, is going and what they want it to look like. So moving over to the uh, other documentary you made, What Happened on September 11th, uh, how did you, uh, how did you come about uh, making uh, this documentary on the events of 9-11 through a children's perspective? So uh, the project originated, um, so the, what happened on September 11th was um, a project that I was asked to make the, the Tribute Museum. And I felt that there wasn't a tool out there for educators to use for kids to learn about September 11th. It seemed that it, for young kids, for little, little, little kids, while they knew there was something called September 11th, they didn't, they're not learning about it in schools. And it really, um, it, it, there was a hope that we could create something that would fill the gap. So I was asked to think about a film about September 11th. And, and the way I always start my projects with kids is I start to, you know, with the interview, sit down with them. And what became clear in the interviews is they had a lot of questions. Um, what happened? Who did it? Why did they do it? And they really didn't have um, any answers to these questions or, or, or they had um, misguided answers. And so the, the hope was that we could create something that would, you know, be a history for kids. Um, it's not something they have any emotional connection to necessarily unless there's a family member who who um, was either a survivor or a victim. And so we set out to really try to create something that could make the event understandable for kids based on their questions. Uh, so uh, in, your, in the conversations that you had with the kids, um, about September 11th, what uh, uh, what surprised you most about how these kids viewed the attacks from almost 20 years ago? Well, um, you know, one of the the distressing things that I, you know, early on, I was talking with a third grader, and she re recounted a play date that she had with a with a little friend, and they were googling things and they entered you know what happened on September 11th and some horrific images came up for them that really 
um, I can't remember exactly what they were, but they just were inappropriate for a little kid, for a seven, six, seven, eight year old to see. And so, um, you know, that that really was interesting to me and, and concerning and made me feel like, you know, kids need to learn about the hard stuff in life and we need to provide them. Um, they're, go they're going to, you know, be exposed to these hard issues and, and it's important to do it right and to tell them honestly without um, sugarcoating bad things that happen, um, present, present, um, present to them in a realistic but but gentle way you know this this horrific terrorist attack so that that was one of the things that um that still resonates for me uh so turning uh, I'm, I'm turning to you know your the you know your your career as a whole uh you know a lot of your films of um have been focused on uh, how children view things or their, their and, and uh, their point of view of things. And I and what I was wondering is why have you focused so much of your documentary filmmaking on understanding things through a child's perspective? Um, well, talking to kids has been my career. It's what, it's what I do. And I think, you know, we benefit when we listen to kids. We benefit from their openness from their questions from their way of explaining the world um i find it to be very um rich and deep talking to kids and um i think that um you know there's something incredibly honest about them um and when in, in terms of tackling deep subjects this has sort of been having the conversation with kids about you know whether it be dreams or the holocaust or gun violence or september 11th um, or climate change i find that um you know these are tough subjects but there's also some hope there's hope that we can do something about this world and kids are obviously the embodiment of hope they they are the future they are um their ideas are going to are going to influence our world and so in terms of the meaningfulness of working on these shows for kids i feel like there's nothing more meaningful uh so uh we are an award site and what's interesting about uh uh, in addition to these amazing uh, uh, documentaries that you've made, is you have won many awards throughout your career. I believe uh, seven uh, primetime Emmys and uh, several honors from the Directors Guild of America as well. Um, this is a two-part question: uh, Does the process of this whole of the whole uh, awards thing ever get boring to you? And also, I'm also just curious: Where do you keep all your trophies? <laughs> Um, well, I, I, you know, it feels so nice to be acknowledged and to be nominated and to be awarded. It just feels so nice, um, because it just elevates these projects in a really, really nice way. The reason we make them is to, um, I think present something, put something beautiful into the world and put something out there that um, reflects um, something rich and deep and interesting. Um, and so the awards are really, really a nice um, honor when they come. They don't always come, but when they do, it's really nice. And in terms of the, you know, the statuettes and I have a small apartment which is filled with um, books and kids and stuff. So they live at the office, which is, you know, a good home for them. Yeah, especially those Emmys because those those wingtips are sharp. Right. Um, right. <laughs> That's not obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Amy. We wish you all the best this Emmy season. And to all our viewers, please like this video, subscribe to our channel to see to get all our latest content. And don't forget to go to goldderby.com and use the Gold Derby app 
So make your predictions and see if you can outsmart the top prognosticators in Hollywood. Thanks so much, Jamie.